It's been about 10 years since he graduated from high school and moved from the countryside to the city. There were trips to work in crowded, shaking cars. There was a lot more work to do and I had to spend all my free time on it. He thought that he would never become the head of such an institution. He barely caught the last train again. He thought sadly that even on weekends, he didn't have the energy to read his favorite historical novels. It doesn't get any easier day after day. Lying at home in his bed, he felt a deadly boredom for the idol of his native village. When he woke up in the morning, he realized that he was filled with strange sensations. Something was wrong. He looked down at his hands and found that they had become small. His body had shrunk to a child's size. He looked anxiously out of the window and didn't recognize the area. Where was he? His thoughts were interrupted by a voice that addressed him as Mr. Fimper Wang. Vaughn saw an agitated girl who looked like a maid who had told him that it was dangerous to be near the window. The boy apologized and asked who she was. The maid named Till threw up her hands. She asked him if he had forgotten everything. Van looked out of the window again and said that the view of the garden was stunning and fascinating. The maid was even more surprised and asked Mr. Pals Wang how he knew such complex words since he was still just over two years old. Van thought about it. He believed that he was not two years old but almost thirty and he was an employee of a Tokyo company. He couldn't figure out what kind of small body he had or where the maid came from. He didn't understand what was happening to him at all. Where did he get the memories of another life? Is this the same reincarnation? Wang asked Till, is she a maid? The girl happily confirmed that it was true. The boy asked the next question. He asked Till if it was true that his name was Van Ne Ferdio. The maid jumped in surprise. Can he even pronounce his last name? It's just wonderful. He's very smart. Van asked her again if it was true that his father was Jalpa Marquis Ferdio, and his brothers were Marcia, Yardo, and Sesto. The maid, still surprised, said that Van hardly ever saw Monsieur Yardo and Sesto, but he knew their names. Vaughn looked into Till's eyes and asked her, but where are they? The entire family of Marquis Jalpa Pula Antiferdio was gathered at a long breakfast table. There was his oldest son, Marcia Alego Ferdio, aged 14, his second son, Yardo Guy Ferdio, aged 10, and his third son, Sesto Air Ferdio, aged 8. They all took their own meals, and Vaughn had a maid at his side all the time to keep an eye on his manners. She praised the boy for the fact that he even eats vegetables very carefully and sits quietly, not spilling anything. Vaughn thought that he was doing quite well. He still couldn't figure out where he was. There was too much attention to him. Maybe it's a cabaret, and he's here as a guest of honor. Then he would have given them 30,000 yen apiece, even though jokes were out of place. Another question nagged at him. Apparently, after being reborn in this world, he still has memories of his past life. But he still couldn't believe what was happening. Vaughn tasted the carrots that were in his dish and found them to be quite good and delicious. At this time, the Marquis turned to Yardo and asked him what he was going to teach today. The boy replied that today he would learn fire magic and battle formation. Vaughn thought with boredom that at lunch, his father would ask children under the age of ten what they would do, and at dinner, he would ask how it went. And so it is every day. Whether it is a tradition of the aristocracy or only children to rest in the morning and in the afternoon to receive education and fencing lessons. Marquis Jalpa stroked his beard and asked Sesto what about him. He replied that he also intended to study magic. Vaughn already knew that he wasn't usually asked, but this time his father addressed him as well, asking the same question as the other brothers. Wang replied that he didn't know much, so he would first study the culture and history of this country. Everyone at the table looked at him suspiciously. After a brief silence, the Marquis laughed out loud and declared that they had spoiled him because he was the last child of his wife Mira, but he had grown up to be a wonderful baby. He noticed that his fire magic must be as strong as his and Mira's. He assumed that their family was now in safe hands and he would look forward to a fair assessment of his magic on the test in six years' time. The Marquis looked at Wang and said that he hoped for him. 
Vaughn already knew that in this world where magic was commonplace, it mattered which kind of magic suited whom. Two kinds are required of aristocrats. Magic of the four elements fire, water, wind and earth to protect the house and territory or healing magic. Having any other magic is shameful. His father and brothers had the ability to use four elements magic, but he believed that other types of magic, depending on the method of using them, could also be useful. House Ferdio, as an aristocracy, is a province in a militaristic state that specializes in military strength, especially the attribute of fire to be powerful in attack. First, there must be a civilization in this world that is as advanced as the countries of the Middle Ages or early modern times. But due to the convenience of magic, the prevalence of gunpowder is extremely low here. Weapons, mostly swords, spears, and bows. The most important thing here is magic. There are three continents and countless islands in this world. Vaughn was currently in a vast country in the southern part of the western Grand Continent. This was the kingdom of Scuderia. The royal family, which has ruled for 300 years, gradually continues to expand its possessions. The current king leads a military aristocracy to invade small countries and then conquer them. Vaughn thought about how it looked like his father had been elevated to the rank of a marquis during the war. This was the only port that ships came through as there were huge monsters deep in the sea waiting to attack. Looking at the map, Vaughn realized that the ships would have a hard time if they got caught in this narrow strait. The boy came to the conclusion that if there is magic, then there are animals that look like monsters. He decided that the age of discovery was not yet possible. Till also informed him that there are different races in this world, elves, dwarves, anthropomorphs and others. In most cases, they are isolated from others, so they rarely meet with each other. Wang told the maid that she was too complicated to explain everything. Till then suggested that Mr. Wang take a nap. The boy refused and said he was fine, and he only asked her because he wanted to know about it. In turn, he asked her if she was tired. The girl replied that she was fine. Vaughn asked her, what about magic tools? She replied that magic crystals, some precious stones and minerals have the ability to store magical power. Tools are created based on your magical abilities. Then he asked the maid a question about magic, which she answered based on her own knowledge. Everyone who watched this boy, who showed remarkable abilities, thought that he was a child prodigy. Some people couldn't believe that he was really only two years old. They were also surprised by his concern for the commoners. This was surprising from an aristocrat. Butler Espada suggested that Mr. Kolez Wang was probably studying letters and prime numbers right now. He asked him how many of them he had already memorized. The boy knew that Espada was a capable butler who had supported his father for many years and seemed to have never spoken to him before. Espada made a stern face and repeated his question. The boy thought that the butler should not communicate so with a two-year-old child, but said that he was good at speaking and listening however, the letters were still a little out of order. Then the butler asked, What about numbers? Wang En shrugged his shoulders knowingly and asked, Is this something like addition and subtraction? Van became very bored and wanted to escape. Espada showed him two fingers on his left hand and three fingers on his right and asked him how many fingers he showed in total. The boy replied that it would be five fingers. The butler also tested his subtraction skills and said that he would study with him twice a week. Learning from him seemed like hell to Van. This is not something a two-year-old should learn. Too many things. When he looked at Espada's stony face, he even wondered if he was an android. And if it was a demonic creature, it would probably be a golem or undead. But still, he continued to take his infernal lessons. He learned to read and write in just a few weeks and learned many things, such as the system of the aristocracy, the governance of the kingdom, and the rules of war. And all this was for a two-year-old child. Thus, Wang spent two years of his life studying. In addition to science, he studied fencing, and everyone found that he had good reflexes. He was fooling around in the room with the maids. Fencing is quite a fun activity. He was practicing with Till and Mako and it was like an exciting game. Fooling around, the girl accused Till of insulting Vaughn by defeating him, 
and she should regret it and the master should punish her. The maids took Till by the arms and she confessed that she had committed a mortal sin by insulting her master, and the boy playfully slapped her on the forehead. The punishment is done, but as expected, Wang had only been fooling around with the maids for half a year. By the time he was five years old and training took place every day, he was already able to fight with young future warriors. In his previous life, he went to judo and karate classes in high school, so he liked martial arts. He was handed a light sword and shield, and Vaughn recalled his trainer's instruction that you can win if you hit first. In judo, it's important to throw your opponent off balance. And in karate, you need to anticipate the opponent's movements in order to deliver an effective blow. He could also use these two points in swordsmanship. His next opponent was about 10 years old, and he was tall, with long arms and legs. Picking up a wooden sword and swinging it, he kept his distance from Vaughn. But he was a kid, so his attacks are always the same. They have their own habits and movements. After watching them over and over again, it was easy to win, especially since he had a huge 30 years of experience. The surrounding adults considered him a child prodigy and noted his undoubted talent for fencing. The servants continued to point out that, unlike Mr. Khan Yard and Sesto, Van was easier to talk to. In addition, they are not interested in swordsmanship, since they are engaged in fire magic. However, with all this, they noticed a certain oddity of Mr. Kanil Wang. One day, the deputy head of the D Knights, one of the strongest members of the Marquis family, approached Wang and asked him to show him his hands. The boy reluctantly complied. D noticed that he had no calluses and the skin on his palms was soft. Wang apologized and said that he would train more when he grew up. The man said that he thought Wang was losing to his students and training at night but it seems that he was wrong. Wang said that he too would study when he could. He assured the knight that he would never stop enjoying fencing. D told the boy that he had heard that Espada had instructed him to learn three times as much as usual. Vaughn was outraged by the amount of studying, finding it strange that he was the only one studying from morning to night. After that, D advised the boy to contact him if he wanted to practice more with the sword. He claimed that the old butler was too keen on studying and someone like him, who could judge people dispassionately, felt that Mr. Benin Wang should follow the path of the sword. He has an innate talent, but he must first learn the basics and build up his muscles and then practice daily. He assured the boy that sooner or later he would make him the greatest swordsman in the kingdom. Vaughn couldn't believe that D was being serious. However, after confirming otherwise, Vaughn said that he liked swords, but he also liked studying. He promised that he would try in both directions. D was a little upset, but said that at least he would still be the one to train him. Vaughn asked the knight to be a little more courteous with him. D agreed with him and said of course he would pay attention to him because he was still a child. And that was another lie. D chased him until he was blue in the face. He made him do a hundred push-ups, a hundred squats, and a hundred jumps. Endless cross-country runs exhausted the boy. He said he needed to rest because they had just been running. D said that he would rest later and urged him to run with him. Van realized that D was a real demon. He did his best and sat down on the bench to rest. The knight noticed this and said that while he was resting, he wasn't doing anything. Why don't they remove this wooden bench and sit outside? Vaughn, looking at the coach, changed his original opinion of him. D wasn't a demon, just an idiot. This maniac was a complete jerk. The older students wished him luck and advised him to do whatever the deputy head of night said. While he was resting on the bench, Till came up to him and praised him for doing a good job. Wang thanked the girl and she said admiringly that it was great that he tried his best every day. Vaughn thought about how it was hard for him, but since he was reborn, something fun happens every day. The sense of satisfaction that he couldn't experience in his previous life was one of the new feelings for him now. He decided that he would become the best aristocrat in the world and enjoy a happy life. Three years later, something changed. A few years ago, Wang was called a prodigy. He didn't even believe it could be. He felt like a failure. His second life, which was so bright, 
it ended abruptly. Two years ago, when Wang was six years old, he was in the city for the first time. His imagination was struck by the numerous buildings and architecture of the metropolis. He never ceased to observe with interest the vast number of people living here. A maidservant spoke to him, who accompanied him on a walk and asked him where he wanted to go. Maybe he wants to look at the market. Six-year-old Van Neferdio still had memories of his past life. Here he was reborn as the fourth son of a marquis and went through the hell of studying and taking swordsmanship lessons every day. They called him a prodigy here. Many people said that twelve-year-old recruits were no longer standing next to Mr. Binan Wang, even though the difference in their physiques was very large, and he learns what adults usually learn. Obviously, it was obvious. Till told him that he was a genius and even managed to excel at swordsmanship and maybe one day he would be able to overtake his brothers and become the head of the family. Vaughn knew that in the world of the aristocracy it was every man for himself. Money, status, reputation, and power the winner takes it all. Becoming one can dramatically change the future. Therefore, an attempt on the younger brother who shows great promise is a common thing for the aristocracy. And unfortunately, Vaughn couldn't say that he had a good relationship with his brothers. He knew that they could kill him without hesitation. In other words, if Vaughn really wanted to become the head of the family, the chances of being killed would only increase. He couldn't live happily with such a life. That day he approached Till and said he wanted to go for a walk. He just wants to be a normal kid. Wang decided to be a slacker. Even though he had decided so, Vaughn had no idea how to have fun in this world, as even in his previous life, he was a workaholic. Till took him to the city's best market to watch and do some shopping. The boy noticed that the market was full of people. Suddenly, Vaughn saw a beautiful building with majestic columns and asked the maid what it was. The girl said it was Mary's company. It has branches all over the kingdom. The young master noticed that this building was so huge and beautiful. He liked it very much. Suddenly, he saw a bound man being led on a rope towards Mary's store. And it was a child. The man who was leading the slave told the passers-by who were staring at them to go their own way instead of gawking. This is not a performance for them, Wang asked who the child was and why he was tied up. The man replied that it was the best thing he could do for his son. Wang inquired about his problems. The man replied that his son was in debt, so he would sell him as a slave. According to the Slavery Act, only two types of slaves are allowed, debt-based slavery and crime-based slavery. However, for a long time now, poor families have been selling children they can't feed into slavery for the sake of their livelihood. The boy realized that the man had transferred debts to his child in order to turn him into a slave. He saw that despite his terrible appearance, this guy didn't even give a voice. Apparently, this is due to the fact that slavery has become commonplace in society. Everyone is used to looking at this. It disgusted him. At this time, a girl recognized Van as the Marquis's son and loudly voiced it. She looked at his outfit, which was crowned with the family crest, and said that it was the famous prodigy, Mr. Van Neferdio. The girl addressed him respectfully and invited him to join Mary's company. She asked what they were looking for. They will be able to prepare anything. She asked them to call her Rosalia and thank them for visiting them. The man who wanted to give his son into slavery looked at the boy and whispered that he was one of the seven Marquias. Rosalia could tell from Vaughn's expression that he was worried about being punished for abusing the slavery system. She also saw that a man had come to sell a child into slavery, and he looked to be about eight years old. Rosalia asked the man how much he was worth and what magic he had. The man replied that he was a master of thieves' magic, and Rosalia offered three silver coins for the guy. The man began to haggle, claiming that the shop across the street paid more than five silver coins for each slave. The longer a slave can work, the more expensive it is, of course, Rosalia stood her ground. She said that any store buys at a lower price than the average, and she intends to give three silver pieces for the guy. If he'd been a girl, she'd have doubled the price. Since a small boy is of little use, it costs less, including the cost of raising him. 
the man swore angrily and hit the boy, saying that it was even impossible to get normal money from him. Wang tried to stop the evil man and said that this was his child, and he shouldn't do this. The man advised him to shut up and not interfere. Rosalia turned to the man and urged him not to be an idiot. Now no one will buy this guy at all. Who knows, he might even be lying about this child. The evil father accused the girl of always making a fool of him, and he no longer intends to sell it to her. He ordered his son to get up because they were heading to another store. Suddenly, Wang turned to the child dealer and said that he was buying a child for five silver coins. The man froze in surprise. Vaughn was thinking at this time that if things continued like this, this boy would be killed eventually. The man asked him incredulously if he had the money. Vaughn replied in the affirmative and Till said plaintively that they had only prepared gold coins and they didn't have any silver coins available. Rosalia then offered to exchange them for silver coins. After receiving the money, the man immediately left without even untying his son's hands. Vaughn leaned over to help the child free himself from the restraints and asked if he was injured and could move around on his own. After that, Wang gave his name and asked what the boy's name was. He said his name was Kamsen. Van told him that he was now free to go wherever he wanted. Till asked Vaughn, didn't he buy him as a slave? He said he was just thinking of helping him. Till reminded the young master that his father had kicked him out of the house. Vaughn realized that he was completely irresponsible, because this guy shouldn't be wandering the streets alone. He suggested that Kamsen go to his house and maybe find a job for him there. Till objected and said that the Marquess would hardly allow more than the entire castle to be left in the mansion. Only if as his slave, Vaughn apologized to the boy and asked if he was okay with it. Kamsen nodded silently. Wang suggested that they look at the clothes for him first. Since he was going to be around him now, he needed some good clothes. Rosalia said that they must first sign a contract and asked for their hands. As soon as it touched their hands, a dark mark appeared on the outside of Kamsen's hand. The girl explained that this is a slave contract and the mark on the slave's hand will be as long as the contract is not terminated. She was a contract magician and said that this time she wouldn't take any payment since this was their first time here. Vaughn thanked the girl but felt guilty that Kamsen had been branded a slave because of him. Rosalia, on the other hand, was flattered by the aristocrat's gratitude. Then she escorted the two young men to the hall to choose clothes for Kamsen. Vaughn asked Rosalia to help pick out some clothes for the slave, and she opted for clothes made of good cloth. She said that slaves were usually given simpler clothing, but that was what she would recommend. Vaughn assured Rosalia that he didn't want Kamsen to look like a slave. Then the girl suggested underwear and shoes that go well with the chosen clothes. Van thought that all sorts of things happened, but he bought a slave on his first walk. Finally, the purchases were completed, and now everything seemed to be in order. In the Marquis's mansion, Kamsen opened the door to the master's room, a crack, and addressed him. He told Vaughn that the deputy head of the D-Knights was looking for him. The young master asked me to say that he wasn't here. Kamsen said that he probably already knew that the master was lying. Van noticed that Kamsen wasn't wearing gloves. He asked why he didn't do it, because he probably doesn't like it when you see the brand. The slave replied that it bound him to it, so let it be in plain sight. Wang protested indignantly and said that he shouldn't show this slave mark since he had bought him gloves to do so. Embarrassed, Kamsen took out his gloves and began to put them on his hands. There was a commotion outside the door as Dee was looking for Mr. Tenawang. He couldn't figure out where the boy had gone since a witness had recently entered the room. Was all his feelings for his master just an illusion? Van had barely managed to hide when Dee burst into the room. He asked Kamsen why there were crumbs on his face it wasn't there before. The young man asked what crumbs he meant. The deputy head of the knights was indignant and said that he had already eaten them. He bribed him, so stop ignoring his orders. Kamsen confusedly said that he was Master Wang's slave after all. The knight was outraged and said that one must have the courage to say such a thing to him. In that case, he would train him instead of Mr. Kane's Wang. 
he should be flattered by this. Peeking out from his hiding place, Vaughn genuinely felt sorry for the poor guy. Thus, Wang became lazy for the sake of a good future. He wanted to be thought of as an ordinary child, not a prodigy. He decided that if Kamzin got tired, he would fill in for him in training. Vaughn was already eight years old, and there was an opinion among the servants as well as the town's residents that this prodigy would soon have a magic test. Everyone was looking forward to it. Many people dreamed that Wang would become a lord because he is very kind to ordinary people. Some people were 100% sure that Mr. Pai Wang had fire magic, just like all the brothers of Marquis Ferdio's family. However, on the test, it turned out that he does not own any of the elements. The four elements. It turned out that little Wang had some production magic. Magic that allows you to create objects. It is also often called one of the most unsuccessful types of magic. This was magic, also known as alchemy. You can use it to prepare materials like iron and copper, and then imagine a shape in your head to create a sword or accessory. It is impossible to create anything more with this magic, since even weapons and jewelry spend a lot of magic power, while other people can easily create items without using any magic. Inventors and blacksmiths don't need it. The whole family was upset. For two years, Wang had done everything he could to avoid being considered a child prodigy, and his brothers had no desire to attempt his life, but such a test score was quite unexpected for him. Aristocrats are expected to use the magic of the four elements, and in the Fortio family, mages with the element of fire or healing are especially welcome. The eldest son, Marcia, has inherited the wind element from his maternal grandmother, but he is more than anyone else trying his best to become the head of the family. Although the wind element is acceptable to nobles, the second and third brothers who possess the fire element are mocking the older brother. Among the aristocrats, the type of magic is extremely important. Jalpa Ferdio was very annoyed. He and his wife Mira wield the element of fire, so why did they have a child with production magic? And this is her last child. Vaughn knew that his mother, weak in body but strong in magic, had died giving birth to him, and his father had high hopes for him. The Marquis sighed heavily and said that he would stop talking. From the very beginning, it was foolish to expect anything more from Vaughn. The boy understood the unpleasantness of the situation. The father frowned and declared that there was no place in the Marquis family for a child born with industrial magic. The Marquis looked at Vaughn in disgust and asked if he was ashamed to be such a loser. Jalpa bared his sword and said he would have to if it didn't disappear from his family. Get rid of it. The boy tried to say something to his father. However, when I saw the brutal look in his eyes, I didn't say anything. Marcia stepped forward. His father asked him what it was. The eldest son said that there is a place in their family's territory that is difficult to develop because of its location. This is a remote village. Why don't they leave it to Van? The Marquis asked why he should leave the village to him. Marcia explained that initially it was inhabited by about a hundred people. They don't do manufacturing, but the Wolfberg Mountains to the north are full of resources. Next to the village is the county of Ferdinand, and on the other side is the hostile kingdom of Araneta. Although it is quite far away, there is a fortress used as a defensive base. In other words, the village can become a camp for preparing an expedition to the lands of Count Ferdinand. Understanding dawned in the Marquis's eyes. He said it was part of the territory he gained when he became a Marquess, and also a place where Count Ferdinand, whose territory was reduced, sends knights to raid. He agreed with his eldest son's opinion and said that if they sent Vaughn to this village, it would be fine to assign knights to his county. Furthermore, just the acquired territory is hardly loyal to their family, and they will assign a person from the Marquis family there. Jalpa shook his head emphatically. He turned to Wang and said that he would become the master of this village. He ordered him to go there as soon as he was ready. Then the Marquis looked kindly at Marcia and told him that he had expected nothing less from him. He found use for completely useless things. Van turned to his brother. And the man knelt down in front of him and asked for forgiveness. He said that his father and brothers were putting a lot of pressure on him because of the wind element 
and it's probably much harder for him in this regard. He had a right to resent him for making such a reckless offer. Wang calmed his brother down and thanked him for his help. If he hadn't helped him, he would have been killed or imprisoned or worse, his tongue torn out and sold as a slave. He stated that no matter how desperate the situation was, he would never waste the opportunity he had given him. Marsha looked lovingly into the eyes of his younger brother and said that he really was a genius. Where did he learn that? He has the mindset of an adult and thinks more deeply than an older brother. Espada and Till have long been bragging about his achievements. Marsha noticed that the Marquis who was sending him to the border would regret it. My brother said there wasn't much he could do right now, but he would do his best. To help him a little, little Wang, the brothers shook hands and Van thanked Marsha for her concern. Till, when she found out about the old Marquis decision, was beside herself with indignation. She said that even without magic, Mr. Bissin and Wang is a smart and wonderful aristocrat, and even that wasn't enough for them to send him to the village. And their master is amazing. Wang warned the girl that it seemed a non-disclosure order had been issued. He thanked Till for her kindness and told her that he was now looking forward to leaving. When Vaughn was left alone, he decided that away from the rigid rules of aristocratic life, he would finally be free. He really hoped it would be like this. He wanted to think about what he had to do in the future. As the master of the village, he might not do anything outstanding and have plenty of free time. He decided to make the village a place for a comfortable and happy life. He'll probably be pretty damn busy now. Aristocrats are just ordinary people. Despite their pompous speech and excessive pride, they run with their tails between their legs and give priority to the interests of the authorities, forgetting about the people and their safety. Simply put, aristocrats look down on commoners, especially the adventurers who roam from place to place. Three such adventurers sat over a beer and talked about the upcoming escort of a young aristocrat. One of them suggested that he might not be a bad guy, or that he might be a headstrong aristocrat who despised people like them. The girl added that this is exactly what most people think about aristocrats. Then why did they accept the request? The third replied that they had little choice if they wanted to stay in the duchy. At that moment Van Ney Ferdio entered the room and introduced himself, thanking them for accompanying him on his journey. He approached one of the adventurers and said that it was nice to meet him and he looked very strong. Wang said he looked like a war hero. The boy noticed that his weapon was bulky too. He asked the guy if it was heavy. He replied that of course it was heavy because the heavier the weapon, the more powerful it is. After the boy came out, one of the adventurers said that it was some kind of luck. It looks like they'll be accompanying an ordinary child. The big man added that he really wanted to pat him on the head. The girl reminded him not to forget to be polite, she almost called him Wang Kun. Vaughn sat among the prepared items on the suitcase and thought that there was nothing strange about dealing with adventurers. The items were loaded into three carts and the knights couldn't go with them, so Marcia hired ten adventurers. At first, Vaughn and Kamsen only had one carriage, but then Till joined them. She insisted that she should go with them, as she was their personal maid. The fact that Vaughn's magic was not suitable for the aristocracy was hidden, and anyone who knew about it was ordered to keep quiet. But some of them couldn't be silenced. This referred to the deputy head of the D-Knights, who insisted that he would accompany them so that he could train them in the village with his swords. Van was absolutely against it. He said that he couldn't use the knights as escorts. D replied that this was the first time he had heard of it and ordered his assistants Abu and Ro to prepare for departure immediately. But that wasn't all. Espada, the butler, also wanted to go with Mr. Pizze's Wang. He told the Marquis that he was retiring a little earlier and since his successor was old enough, he agreed. He is already 55 years old and wants to relax in the countryside. Besides, the old man had already prepared the carriage, and Vaughn was surprised at how quickly he did it. Did his father let go of Espada, who had worked for him for so many years, so easily? It must be hard to find a successor who can replace him. The butler jokingly remarked that he wanted to see if he could learn anything from Wang in his old age. The boy asked him not to joke like that. 
He wondered why Espada and D were following him to a remote village. Although he was glad that D, who was strong in battle, and Espada, who knew a lot of things, would be on his side. Till looked at her master's happy face and asked him, did something good happen? She noticed that Wang was smiling. He hadn't thought it would happen at all, but now this trip to the border was bothering him. However, he told the maid that he was glad to have her by his side and thanked her for it. The girl replied that she wasn't the only maid who wanted to go with him. But she's his personal maid. That's what she told Master when she was fighting for this position. The young Master thought that he could take anyone he wanted. Why did they decide that this was a competition with a single winner? That was the end of his life surrounded by cute maids. Meanwhile, Till said that Monsieur Marcia was a very busy man who didn't have time to chat with the maids and messers. Yarda and Sesto didn't care about the maids. However, Mr. Di Wang is different from them. Always greets them, sometimes treats them, and even helps with cleaning. They even practiced with the sword together and all the maids love it very much. Vaughn felt uneasy at the words. He looked at the Kunzin and said that this also applies to him, and if he wants to, he can stay. And the slave contract can be broken or changed, he can ask Marsha to look after him. However, Kamzin firmly stated that he was determined to devote his entire life to Mr. Kuan Wang and would always serve him faithfully. The young master felt awkward again and asked the guy, does he really like him that much? Kamzin gravely replied that he liked it very much and literally adored it. Finally, everyone was gathered and it was time to set out. Vaughn climbed into the carriage, which didn't have the Marquis family crest on it as his father didn't want anyone to know about his departure. It just has to pretend that it doesn't exist. He had been in the city a lot for the past two years, so he was a little sad to leave it. Suddenly, he saw the daughter of one of the guards running towards his carriage. She asked the gentleman why he was going somewhere. Van, in turn, asked who had told her that. Recently, the young master had been constantly plagued by the awkwardness of getting too much attention from outsiders. It turned out that Mr. D had trumpeted the departure. A rider riding nearby said he found it sad that they were running away like criminals in the middle of the night, so he decided to reveal it to everyone around him. Wang pointed out that his father had ordered him not to tell anyone about it. He was told that Mr. D probably didn't know about it. He must be sleeping in the carriage right now, but when he wakes up, he'll be notified. The crowd on the street was saying goodbye to Mr. King Wang. Everyone already knew that the Marquis's youngest son was leaving, and many people came out to see him off. Many people asked him where he was going as they watched the carriage go and asked him to come back quickly. Some speculated that Wang had gone to the Royal Academy. Vaughn looked out of the carriage window, thanked everyone, and said goodbye with a raised hand. The young master didn't think that he would be so worried. It turns out that saying goodbye is very sad. Then he noticed that Till was crying. In the middle of the journey, Vaughn ordered a campsite, and he tasted the grilled meat cooked over the campfire. Except for the time he'd slept in the car of his world, in a dangerous place full of magic and all, this was the first time this had happened to him. The person who had treated Vaughn to the meat was one of the members of the two adventurer groups hired to accompany him. His name was Ortho Sith, and he was the leader of the group. He had been working for more than 20 years and was used to communicating with different customers, and despite the fact that it was an eight-year-old child, he behaved very professionally. The young master thanked him for guarding the perimeter, but reminded him that he should not forget to rest as well. Ortho leaned forward with a smile and told the boy that he would come back to him later with a report. At this time, Till came over with drinks and said that even an adventurer could see the young master's kindness. She can also name more than a hundred good things about him. Soon the wagon train continued on its way. After leaving one city and going to another, they set up many camps. During this time, I visited four cities, small and large, because of the large baggage, they moved slowly. Every day they traveled from 50 to 100 kilometers. After traveling anywhere from 500 to 1,000 kilometers in two weeks, Vaughn realized that the Marquis territory was simply vast. 
He thought that in Japan, they would have already traveled through three or four prefectures, although he wasn't sure about the number. While Wang and Till were looking at the map in the carriage, the maid said that they would be arriving soon. And the young master thought that going to the village was like transferring the head of one department to another, and he should make a good first impression. Suddenly, one of the adventurers reported that things were bad in the village. It seems that someone attacked her. It looked like the village was really under attack. It was a raid by bandits or former mercenaries. It's either you or you. D said you get used to fighting over time. There was a wooden fence built around the village that looked quite impressive, but it wasn't very effective against arrows. In front of the gate, the entrance to the village, a straight line of fighters in strong armor was lined up, and behind them were mages. All the villagers had to do was defend the village from the inside, like a turtle in a shell. D turned to the young master and asked permission to join them in the battle. If they work together, they'll come up with something. Vaughn was aware that their opponents would be forty to fifty men, even if they attacked suddenly, they would still be outnumbered. He asked the knight if it was worth the risk. He thought it was too dangerous. D agreed with Wang, he assumed that there might be injuries and casualties, but they would definitely be able to recapture the village. The head of adventurers stated that he has a rule. Do not expose team members to deadly risks, such situations are not uncommon among adventurers. And if he had put his life on the line every time, he would have been in his grave long ago. D exclaimed that however, there are times when they have to give up their lives, and this is one of those moments. He claimed that this was his lord's first domain, and its first inhabitants. And if he doesn't unsheath his sword in a moment of danger, then who will? Ortho Sith told him that he was a noble knight, but unfortunately, the same could not be said for them. Even if they get paid more money, he's not going to die. D then told the adventurer that if the situation worsened, they could run away. Ortho said that his other two knights would also die. At this time Espada entered the conversation and said that he was against it. The old man stated that there will be more than thirty people fighting against him, including mages, he thinks that half of them are mages. And then D would die too, and then there would be no point in retaking the village. The adventurer asked him, does he mean that they won't fight? The butler replied that he was the ultimate four-element mage. The ground is just right under their feet, so they can rely on his support. The adventurer doubtfully asked him, is he really going to fight? He doesn't need to take any chances. Espotter reported that he would build a wall first, and the adventurers would attack from behind the wall at some distance. When the enemies pay attention to them, D and his knights will attack them from the side. Ortho asked the butler, but what should they do with the mages? And if they bring up the archers, they will also be the losers. The young master said, pointing to the carriage, this carriage is lined with iron plates in some places. After making the first attack, you can get in it and leave. The only task is to attract the enemy. He asked Esrad if he intended to stay and fight. He firmly replied that if he stayed behind the wall, D and the others would die. The young master said that in that case he was against it, because then he will die. However, the old butler asked Mr. D. Wang to let him be selfish this time. Vaughn asked him, what if he becomes a decoy then? Everyone present looked at the boy in bewilderment and said in unison no. Especially opposed was Till, who said that she would not forgive the young master if he became a decoy. If he did, then she would personally go out to the enemy. Vaughn calmed her down and told her that if he joined the battle as well, they would definitely win. Kamzin slapped his hand on his chest and said that he would also go with Till. Van raised his hand and asked for attention. He said that he was now the master of this village. So they should listen to him. The young master said that they only hired adventurers to accompany him to the village, and they are not required to participate in the fighting. Then he turned to Espada and told him that he was now retired. After making such a huge contribution to the Marquis family, he can't die in a place like this. D and the others still belong to his father and serve him first. The Marquis wouldn't like it if something happened to them. Then Van turned to Till and said that she was like an older sister to him, with whom he had spent more time than with anyone else. He doesn't want to see a loved one die. 
He also spoke to Kamzin and said that he was pleased with his feelings, but even if he was a slave, he had to choose whether to live or die. He will be happy to know that he is happy with his life. Wang gave everyone a bright look and said that they were all willing to follow him who was labeled unworthy and kicked out of the family. Wonderful people like them don't have to die. He just gives them orders without doing anything himself, but he will never be like the boss in his previous life. He should be responsible and first do something himself, for which he apologizes to everyone. Gripping the hilt of his sword tightly, Vaughn said that he would ride the carriage ahead first and they should attack the enemy from different directions. Focusing your forces on ranged attacks will be pointless. If it doesn't work out, they have to run. They might even throw his corpse away if he was killed. Since they don't know their names, they won't bother the Marquis. Everyone listened to the young master with great attention. After that, Ortho Sith said that this time they would put their lives on the line because even the child said that he would sacrifice his life. If he said it again, they would get angry. The adventurer girl, addressing the young master, said that she did not expect such an act from an aristocrat. Everyone she'd met before did nothing but scratch their tongues. Vaughn addressed Plurial San by her first name, much to the girl's surprise. After all, he had even memorized the names of the adventurers. She looked the boy seriously in the eye and said that she was thinking that she could give her life for him. Pluriel added that they were all thinking the same thing now. Vaughn lowered his gaze because he couldn't say that he remembered her name just because she was cute. Drawing his sword, Deputy Night Chief D. Solemnly said that they, the noble knights who served the Marquis, understood that serving Lord Wang was the same as serving the future heir, and now they will protect him, as if they were protecting the future of the family. Espada said, looking at the young master, that when this was all over, he wanted him to think about all the responsibility that would fall on the shoulders of the candidate for heir. He assured him that they would manage in three days. Vaughn looked up at the butler and thought about how very tall and intimidating he was. Espada suggested using his strategy. First, it will create a wall and attack from a long distance. D and his knight will attack from the left, while Ortho's team will attack from the right. The others who can defend themselves will stay here. After that, the command to go ahead was given and everyone rushed to complete their missions. The eyes of the young master's companions were filled with rage and determination. Everyone saw that Espada had already created the walls. This meant that the old man wasn't a bad magician at all. It's unlikely that a four-element mage will work as a butler, but this one works. D asked Ortho why he hadn't turned the young nobleman down and decided to risk his life. The adventurer replied that this boy was going to be a great man and he couldn't die yet. If it was possible, he would like to make him a king. In the past two weeks, he had completely revised his views on aristocrats. He didn't know that there were such people among the aristocrats. During this time, he managed to gain respect for Mr. Main Wang. He decided that if the master was in trouble, he would come to the rescue. But he didn't know him then. The owner of a small village, whose escort seemed to him a troublesome task. That's what he thought but he put his life on the line when it came to his responsibilities, not only for the territory and the inhabitants, but also for the knights, the butler, the maid, and the slave. Moreover, for the sake of the adventurers' lives, he proposed a strategy in which none of them would die, but in which the eight-year-old child himself will die. Ortho shook his head and added that he was a strange man. At this time, Kamzin warmly embraced his master, and with all sincerity and love, he said that if he was on the verge of death, he would rather cover for him and die. The boy added that they all look more like a family than his real relatives, and now, when the battle is going on, he must do something to help. Wang then said that the three of them would get medicine and tools out of the carriage. Those in the rear decided that if it became too dangerous, they would help the others. The bandits who were besieging the village wall let their guard down. In small settlements, there is no sound management, so such an attack usually ends quite quickly. They continued to shell the village and thought with anticipation, how many women are there in this village? Anyway, they're supposed to be celebrating today. Suddenly, one of the bandits fell down, struck by an arrow in the back. 
the robbers saw that there were walls behind them. They couldn't figure out where they came from. The enemy was very puzzled after being attacked from both sides. D and his knights could easily use their swords to deal with the bandits. The deputy head of the knights of the family, Ferdio D, proved to be a real war machine. The enemies fled in terror, stunned by the power and strength of this warrior. Panic broke out among the bandits. The bandit ranks were considerably reduced, and Ortho Sith decided that was a good thing. His professionalism and skills were also respected. He fought with great skill and ferocity. There was no way the enemies could stop him. Suddenly, the adventurer noticed the danger. Long-range attackers would have to be distracted by the enemy because they were approaching the defender's back line. They were getting closer and closer. Pluriel grimaced in annoyance. She had already used magic and couldn't use the next one until ten seconds later. When she saw an armed enemy very close by, she thought that she would not have time to use her magic skill, and now she would die. The girl called for the young master's help and shouted to him that the warrior with heavy equipment was right in front of her. Van, along with Kamzin, rushed to her aid. The girl thought it was reckless. Two kids can't stand up to him. Suddenly, Wang threw his sword at the feet of this formidable opponent, knocking the weapon out of his hands. Pluriel got the right time and cast her magic. The heavily armed robber was rendered harmless. Vaughn had warned that all the enemies might be rushing here and that you had to keep your eyes open. Pluriel, looking at the young master's actions, wondered what was wrong with this child. The battle soon came to an end. A few of the bandits managed to escape, but the rest were defeated and Wang's warriors had no casualties. It was the best outcome anyone could have hoped for. Ortho Sith was tying up the prisoners, and the adventurers on his team said that as soon as they received the other half of the payment, they would disperse. Pluriel looked at them longingly and asked why they were doing this. She, for example, became interested. Ortho turned to his men and asked if they would like to stay here instead of paying them. They responded by apologizing that this order was convenient as they were heading to a neighboring county. They're sorry, but they'll see each other again. Ortho wished them a safe journey. However, some people decided to stay because there are dense forests and mountains nearby, and they have not hunted for a long time. In addition, they can even earn something here. Pluriel said that Vaughn was like ordinary aristocrats, but any adult would envy his mindset. Ortho agreed with the mage and said that was why he wanted to stay here. The young master is so small and already so smart. Not everyone raised as an aristocrat becomes like that. He's a genius. Vaughn seems like an ordinary arrogant aristocrat, but once he starts talking, he's a completely different person polite and laid back, but fun and friendly with people. He may be an aristocrat, but he has no desire to look down on others. Ortho Sith thought about it and said that he had never seen such aristocrats before. Some adventurers agreed with him, but pointed out that his magic was completely unsuitable for combat and highlighted the oddity that he was literally ready to die. Pluriel reminded everyone that he had saved her when she was in danger and she owed him a debt. One of the adventurers said that he wouldn't have thought of that as a child. He uses the sword like a normal knight. The adventurers continued to discuss the topic related to this extraordinary child, and he wasn't even ten years old yet. Ortho once again said that he was the best of all the aristocrats he knew, and there is no doubt about it. If one day he becomes the ruler, then he would like to see how big the territory that belongs to him will be. He asked his comrades again if they were willing to help him. The adventurers agreed. They stayed in the village. Till turned to the young master and asked him to put his life above them. To avoid further communication and awkwardness, Vaughn agreed with her and said that he would do so. However, he thought about the fact that he needed to make an effort to be needed in this place. His involuntary harshness towards his maid brought her to tears. Pluriel jokingly reproached him for this, and the young master replied that he tries to be honest with girls, especially with those who are dear to him. The mage girl asked him, is he an elf by any chance? In childhood, they are not particularly different from people. It occurred to Pluriel that as before, so now she wasn't being very polite to an aristocrat. 
Vaughn explained to the girl that Till had been taking care of him since he was a child, so she needed to make sure that he was an ordinary person. Pluriel thought that the young master didn't care and asked where he learned swordsmanship. Vaughn pointed his hand at Dai and said that this knight had trained him even though he was still too young. He said that he was training him to become stronger than the knight himself. The adventurer kept up and asked if Butler Espada had trained him. Wang confirmed her guess and said that his way of thinking was made up of the people around him. After that, the mage girl bowed to the young master and stated that his actions and swordsmanship saved her in a moment of danger. The girl thanked him and said that she would never forget it. Vaughn replied that it was fine and she could forget about it. Pluriel looked thoughtful. She thought that as an aristocrat, this person was very charismatic. No matter how you look at it, he's already won the hearts of adventurers. The butler, Espada, spoke to the young master and informed him that the villagers were gathered at the gate. Till, who had calmed down, said cheerfully that this might not be what they expected, but they had finally arrived at their destination. Vaughn agreed with her and thought that this was his first time meeting the residents and therefore he needed to make a good impression on them. The residents who were waiting to meet the Lord were wary and silent. A young gentleman came up to them and told them that his name was Van Nee Foltio. He said that he was sent here by Lord Foltio, who has recently ruled this territory, including their village. From now on, he will rule this village. An old man with a white beard stepped forward and introduced himself as village elder Rhonda. He thanked the young master for helping the village. Wang thanked the old man and informed him that he was pleased to meet the elder. Then he turned to the residents and said that he had heard rumors that neither the owners nor the soldiers took command in this village. He wants to protect this village, so from now on, he takes on the role of chief and hopes for their understanding and help. Vaughn apologized and decided that the apology was too formal. The elder found the young master's words very kind and invited him to come to his house. He said that once there were 150 people living in this village. But half a year ago and last month, the village was attacked by bandits, so now there are only a hundred people left. Today was the third attack and everyone was different. Van asked Rond why he thought they were the main target. The old man replied that he thought it was because the border with the Geronetta Kingdom was close to the village. The border guard knights had patrolled the border during Count Ferdinand's time, but now that the Lord had changed, the border was abandoned. Simply put, the village is in danger because it now belongs to Lord Feltio. Vaughn thought about how other nobles would have had Rhonda's head blown off for saying such a thing. The young master apologized and said that the former ruler Count Ferdinand had supporters in every city. It turns out that his father, Lord Feltio, appointed rulers only for large cities and the situation of small villages is still unknown. The elder assumed that the master had put them aside. A small village is a village that doesn't need to be protected, and it pays almost no taxes. Wang assured the elder that he would notify him of everything from now on. Wang said there was no point in complaining, lamenting or criticizing the state of the country. They might not believe it, but that wouldn't change anything. Malaga, the son of Rhonda, a huge man of powerful build, jumped up from his seat and asked the young master if this was what he was telling the nobles. Vaughn realized that a healthy body and bright eyes, in contrast to the man's short-tempered personality, would not bring a good future to this village. He asked Malaga to sit down and explained that he was speaking for the village. Wang said that meant they had to be responsible. Perhaps the founder of the kingdom, King Berlinet, left a flaw by making a mistake in the law. He asked them what they should be afraid of, even though he will become the ruler of a village that is on the verge of destruction. The king has bandits. However, nothing can be changed by complaining about the laws of the kingdom and what it should be. But this village has them all. Wang said there are three specific measures, three solutions to the problem. First, we need to create something of value that the kingdom can't ignore. Second, earn money regularly and hire mercenaries. The third, reconstruct and develop the village independently. Ronder replied that they had also thought about it, however, none of these measures can be carried out so easily. 
Vaughn nodded his head in understanding and said that if they were in such a remote location, even if they were to sell wood or stone, it was impossible to make a profit due to transportation cost issues. However, due to poor education, it will be difficult for rural residents to produce handicrafts that have a market value. And if so, they won't be able to make a profit, which means there's no need to reconstruct the village. However, they appeared in this village. Vaughn clenched his hand into a fist vigorously and said that he knew it wasn't easy for them, but now he had come with the necessary education and he would do his best for the defense and development of this village. At that moment, the butler, Espada, asked for the floor. Before speaking, he introduced himself and said that he was the butler of Lord Feltio's house and that his name was Espada. The old man said that Mr. Benkan Wang, despite being eight years old, was entrusted with the management of the land. Many people consider him a gifted child for this reason. Although it was too bold of him, that was why he and the deputy leader of the D-Knight Order had come to serve them faithfully. He asked the elder to let them join their squad. Malaga was surprised that the butler and deputy would want to do this. But why are such high-ranking officials in their village? It's like a dream. Lord Wang's fourth son is also here, do they want to help them? Malaga asked Wang if he was also proficient in the four elements. The young master replied with dignity that he didn't own any of them, so let them not expect combat assistance along that line. Malaga turned his head in annoyance. Weakling, Vaughn announced that their first priority was to reinforce the walls so that no one would sneak in. He said that the fence is quite strong, but it is made of wood and vulnerable to fire. The same goes for wooden dwellings. The young master asked Espada if the stone would still be strong and solid after using magic. The old man replied that as long as the magic is active, it will remain solid, but later it will become an ordinary lump of earth. Then he ordered to use lumps to strengthen the walls and any size will do. He was sure that they would have time to build a solid wall before the next attack. Also, the young master ordered to dig a ditch, which will help them to isolate themselves from the robbers. D assured Wang that he and his team would take care of it, they were already used to digging ditches. The knight also suggested making some traps and preparing for an attack from the wall. Wang said they would need bows and arrows or stones even easier for the peasants. Then the young master turned to Elder Ronda San and asked him to gather all the villagers to greet them and explain his plan to them. When the settlers had gathered, Wang laid out his plan clearly and clearly. He assured the villagers that he would do everything possible for the development of this village and thank them for their support. He said that although he was still a child, he had strong and intelligent people behind him. If the bandits come, they will all fight them back together. He called on the peasants to be strong because they all need to build a prosperous village together. Vaughn was pleased with his speech and the fact that he looked very much like a politician right now. Suddenly, a man in the crowd raised his hand and addressed him. He asked the young master what would happen to the taxes. So far, they had paid 30% of the harvest, as well as the skins and fangs of monsters. Wang noticed that this was too much and ordered the tax to be lowered to 10%. If these fees are not enough, then he intends to pay once himself. Vaughn understood that, above all, it was important that the villagers had a stable life. There are cases when people sell their children because of debts and farmers will be happy to reduce taxes. A woman with a child asked Wang what would happen if the bandits returned soon because they couldn't call the night order for help. The message will take two weeks and it will take a week to confirm. Another three weeks will be spent on the night's journey to the place of challenge. And it's too late to call for help. Most likely they won't come because of the long distance and because their village is abandoned. Would they be abandoned? Vaughn replied that he understood their anger, but the Marquis currently didn't have the budget or knights to defend such a huge territory. Even if they could persuade the knights, there would be too few of them to help them. They would need 200 men. You'd have to pay for food, horses, armor, and tools, and the cost of mercenaries will be even higher. Vaughn then turned to Espada and asked if he could build a magic wall behind a wooden fence. The villagers saw the results of the magician's work with fear and admiration. 
Behind the wooden palisade of their precarious wall, a huge, solid magic wall grew in an instant. Wang again addressed the residents and said that now, more than ever, they need their help. If they are with them, this village will survive and become much stronger. The newcomers did not have enough accommodation and so many rested in carts. Rhonda offered to give up his house for housing, but Van was sorry to put it out on the street. Up to this point, he had never complained that he only had production magic. But he had never felt so bitter as this. However, he knew that if you didn't know how to use element magic, there was nothing you could do about it. He tried to appeal to the villagers, but their mood is extremely skeptical. He must win their trust for the sake of the success of the village and the happy life of its inhabitants. Vaughn clenched his fists resolutely and thought about using his magic to protect this village. It will make it a pleasant place for people to live. Sitting around the campfire, the defenders of the settlement conferred. Vaughn said that ideally, if the enemy didn't attack them, then they would be able to attack him. D said that magic bows and arrows were usually used to attack from walls, and Ortho Sith said that an attack from a low wall would not be so effective. Elder Ronda remembered that they used to use spears to attack the enemy through the gaps in the forest fortress. D noticed that the enemies were now in the same position, and they would be able to hit them with spears again. Unexpectedly, Wang said that they needed a catapult here. Espada was surprised and reminded Mr. Damachi Wang that the catapult was a siege weapon, and they couldn't use it for defense. Rhonda asked what it was all about. D replied that the catapult fired huge boulders, but it was difficult to determine where they would fall, and it also took time to reload the catapult itself. However, the fortress walls and observation towers are quite large, so they can easily be destroyed with it. The young master's face brightened, and he said that it was all settled then. The damage radius will be greater if they use a box filled with small stones. They will aim it at the gate, and their attack will become much more effective. D added that if they put a bottle of oil and a torch in there, they would probably set the ground on fire, which would make their offensive even stronger. Espada asked who created this mechanism. The young master replied that he created it and thought that they didn't believe in its production magic at all. He doesn't fully understand it himself to master it. On the way to the village, he often used it to learn how to freely change the shape of stones, wood and metal, and now is the time to show everyone what he has learned. During the trip, when they stopped to rest and hunt, and they were just about to get to the village, Ortho Sith said that he would stay in this village for a while, even though it was fun, to earn some extra money by hunting mystical monsters. Now they were moving through the forest in search of suitable trees, and the adventurer said that he sensed monsters and should hurry. He asked Wang to cut down the nearby trees for safety reasons. The young master marveled at Ortho's intuition. During the journey, he easily notices and destroys enemies that no one even suspects. Despite his skill, there was no way Vaughn could raise his level. Kamzin found a tree that was perfect for cutting it down, but it was too big for Vaughn to handle. The other tree also seemed big to him. He didn't get the shape clearly enough, so if he used magic, the new shape would be strange and fragile. He wouldn't call production magic easy to use. However, if he introduces even a small part, he can get what he wants. He wrapped his arms around a small tree trunk. The bottom of my stomach gradually became warm, and the power reached my fingertips. He knew that this image should be as small and detailed as possible. It should even represent tree fibers. If he can, they will intertwine with each other, and the cords will form a strong knot. He seemed to be doing it. When the fibers are divided into small pieces and bound together, they are transformed into a wooden cube. This cube is made of wood, but it looks like plastic. Is that really all? Vaughn was enthusiastically using the skill he had trained. He successfully made magic blocks out of wood, similar in structure to nanofibers. It is stronger than wood under any treatment, and he intended to make many of these blocks. He said that they would process them later but first they would have to transfer them to the carriage. While he, Kamzin, and Till were loading the blocks, Ortho and his team returned from the forest with the demon beast they had taken on their shoulders. Ortho looked at the block the young master had made in surprise. 
he noticed that it was much tougher than he had thought. Breaking it is a real challenge. Vaughn was curious to see how strong it turned out. He tossed the cube into the air and Ortho slashed at it with lightning speed. When the block hit the ground, no one saw a single scratch on it. At the same time, the adventurer's sword broke the stone. Everyone concluded that the resulting block was incredibly strong. Van asked Ortho which was harder, stone or wood. The adventurer replied that it was obviously a rock because it broke under his impact, but this light block didn't. The young master was satisfied, so he must have found something very useful. It was unexpected and pleasant. Vaughn was sitting in front of a large pile of his wood, stone and metal wares. He was wondering if his magic was exhausted or not. Does this have any consequences? He'd heard that magic was complicated, but it had logic. Vaughn was happy to look at the little things that he had managed to make with his skill. He was curious about how magic worked. First you need to imagine the whole weapon, its metal, sharpened blade, shape. And after that, if everything is done correctly, you will get a beautiful weapon like this. Vaughn was holding a newly made sword in his hands, and Kamzin, who was watching the magic, was in awe. The young master gave this weapon to him as a gift, and the young man replied that it would be their family heirloom. When Till saw the samples of weapons and other items Master Wang had magically crafted, her excitement was boundless. She was delighted with the quality and beauty of the products. Vaughn gave her a dainty battle axe as a gift. The girl thanked him, and Van asked if she liked such weapons. He made it powerful, and so that it was impossible to scratch it or break it. Till clutched the weapon to her chest and declared that she loved axes and was absolutely thrilled with this cool hatchet. Vaughn was glad that she liked the weapon and promised her that he would make more decorations for it, but a little later. Vaughn wasn't sure how much magic power was consumed when making such items, but wouldn't it improve his production magic? All this can be used in an unusual way. Surprisingly, magic blocks took shape once every half day. Ortho turned to Van and told him that he thought this butler Espada was a little crazy. Although, in fact, he is a very good magician. Van was glad that everyone was putting him on the same level as an Espada. The old man is a good butler and has supported the Marquis through difficult times. Pluriel Espada also seemed strange. She said that such mages were usually attracted to the army, and if he was an adventurer, he would be a top-ranked mage. Wang stated that he was glad that he had followed him, even though he was about to retire. The future is as important to him as the past. The young master expressed the hope that Espada would have a happy old age. The old man had told him that he was growing up before his eyes, and that now, as a lord, he would have to accept the full responsibility and weight of the title. He wondered if he hadn't made any progress in the last three days but he gave priority to strengthening the village's defenses. Wang assured the old man that he would immediately work on strengthening the gate. Espada was surprised and asked if he was going to strengthen them. D volunteered to help the young master with this. Piling stones in a pile is not difficult for them. Vaughn couldn't understand why everyone around him was so stupid since he was here to do something with magic. Hearing this, the deputy head of the knights was delighted. He admired his master. He told him that no matter how hard he worked, he couldn't do anything with magic. Instead of answering, Vaughn walked over to the gate and touched it with his hands. He said it was a tree. The process of strengthening is similar to the manufacture of ordinary wooden blocks. The only thing that bothers him is his weight. This is the key to defending against the enemy. He performed magic actions and said this is all they have for now. Then they'll make a heavy gate out of metal. D. Espada and many other villagers were surprised to see a huge, powerful gate with serious bolts that appeared out of nowhere and a reinforced, reinforced wall. Everyone was surprised by the young master's abilities, in addition to being more powerful. The gate also had a beautiful appearance. Van was pleased with his creation. He was able to do it. The young lord turned to Orthosan and said that if he cut down this door with his sword, it would immediately be restored. He asked him to spare no effort. The adventurer asked in disbelief, is he sure about this? 
Vaughn replied that he wanted to test the power of the wall so he should do his best. Ortho agreed and swung his sword. The experienced warrior rained down his blows on the new wall, but no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't break it. Everyone was surprised, except for the author of this wall. He saw a scratch on the wall and said that wood was not a very suitable material and that the trees were not suitable in the first place. Everyone rushed over and couldn't believe that it was Vaughn who did it. Why wood is so hard is simply unimaginable. The young master smiled and said that he thought he could help them. At least that's what he hopes. Van settled back in the carriage for the night, but sleeping in cramped rooms with only a sleeping bag is very uncomfortable. In addition, there is no way to wash like a human being. On the way, they stopped for the night in camps and wagons, and even on arrival in the village they have to sleep in a carriage. Vaughn thought about the fact that he was a noble after all. He remembered his father, who was angry at him for not having certain magic skills. Now, in fact, he felt more like an adventurer than a noble. The night passed quickly in thought, and morning came. When he got out of the carriage, he saw Till and Kamsin saying good morning. They started a small cleaning of the territory. Vaughn, looking at them, realized that he was fine, but these two and the others were much worse. They are too exhausted to allow this to continue. Vaughn considered providing food, clothing, and shelter for the village before he could start defending it. He decided that he should try to create a house. The young lord turned to Kamsin and asked him to bring some wooden blocks. After a while, a large pile of these blocks was formed in a clear clearing. The village elder of Rhonda came up to them and asked what it was. Wang replied that he wanted to build a house on the property. The elder became concerned and asked if it was dangerous and if the area was suitable for it. Vaughn assured the old man that everything was fine. This is the center of the village and Wang's mansion will look great here. And then you can build a square nearby, and when they have free time, they can organize some kind of festival there. Vaughn knew that he was quite strong. But will he ever be able to build something more than a house? He thought that he could live there with Till, Kamsin and Espada, and that D and the knights would have their own quarters. First, he decided to make four load-bearing beams and then decide on the size of the house. Van decided to pretend it was a wire and stick it in the ground. The thicker the column, the better. Then the floor and walls are needed, and only then can the roof be assembled. Van had imagined the house in his head, but now it seems so much bigger. Also, this house still needs internal walls. Soon the young master had used up all the blocks, but the house was ready. It now had a kitchen and toilet, one large bedroom and a smaller one. There are also two small rooms left. Something must be done about them, otherwise Espada will be angry. Wang also decided to put shutters on the windows and ask the merchants about quartz sand. When everything was ready, Van looked at his creation and wondered if the house was too big. When the butler saw it, he said that the house was even a little small. However, it is the largest mansion in the area. He noticed that the structure didn't look like it was made of wood at all and looked just fine. Till couldn't believe that this could be built in just one second. Mr. Kenny Wang's magic reminded her of the abilities of kings. Vaughn agreed with her that his magic was very interesting, but he still thought that strong attacking magic was much better. Wang said that the people should feel as if they were behind a stone wall behind their lord. Till contradicted him and told him he was wrong. She would rather live in his city than in the city of Marquis Jalpa. Vaughn thought that this was 100% a girl's personal feeling. The butler took the position of a servant and said that Mr. Pan Wang was right when it came to war, but in times of peace, people wanted a ruler who would make their lives better, and he couldn't name a person who would fit the role better than Wang. Ispada stated that he would always follow him. Vaughn thanked the old man and saw the villagers rushing towards the mansion. They looked at the new building with surprise and admiration. They could believe that there was a house built with magic. Just a few minutes ago, he wasn't here. D, looking at this miracle, said that if they could get more wood, they could build houses for everyone. He ordered them to bring wood to the village, and if necessary, they should use carts, but to have everything here by noon. Everyone began to obey this order. No one has ever seen such speed. 
And where did the usual relaxed country vibe go? Ortho Sith turned to his adventurers and told them that they were also going to the forest at once. He will cut down, and they will transport everything on their carts. He urged them not to let the knights outrun them. The adventurers also began to follow his orders. Then Wang saw that all the villagers were gathered in front of him. He heard the question, why does he need a house? Malaga, coming out of the crowd, said that he had been told that he could build houses. When Vaughn nodded his head in agreement, there were calls for help from the villagers. One of them said that the roof of his shack was leaking, and another had a floor that had fallen in, and a third had a rotten door. The young lord realized that, as he had expected, one house was not enough. I shouldn't have said it, but it's true that their houses are very frail. Vaughn raised a reassuring hand and told them to get in line. Wang assured all the villagers that he would provide them with new housing. He thought that if his magic could make these people happy, then he would have no other choice.